you. There you go. This is the official handoff here. Now we can really start. So let me turn this the right way. There we go. Thank you all for having me. As you know, 20 plus years ago, I was a computer science graduate and I was 100% committed to spending my career behind a desk writing code. And then I started writing code and realized I was incredibly fidgety. Now my mother would have told me this because she knew, but I hadn't yet realized it. I had to have all these toys at my desk. And in addition to um, you know, Slinky and Drinking Bird and a six foot tall Droidica from the Phantom Menace release that may or may not have been dragged out of a movie theater late at night, um, I had a little egg of kind of old school putty and I play with it. And I realized that I really, it was my go-to. It was my favorite thing. And then I also started wondering why it was the way it was. Why couldn't it be bigger? It was made for five-year-old hands and I no longer had five-year-old hands. It was made in a kind of a color that wasn't super exciting. <laughs> Could it be different? Well, as I continued to play with it, I noticed that all my coworkers started stealing my putty. So it wasn't just me that was enjoying it. Everybody liked it, and everybody wanted more. And that is when everybody started calling me crazy, when I started selling it from a box under my desk with a scale, and, hey, come on over, Ray. Oh, you want a half pound? No problem, we'll get that done. Don't worry, manager's at lunch. So when Laris came to me and talked about creative mornings, uh, I got very excited about the theme for wonder, because maybe 17 or 18 years ago, was that moment, it was a leap of faith into the world of wonder. And that was when myself and my wife decided we were gonna quit our jobs and we were gonna make putty full time. We were gonna leave computers behind. Unlike plumbing, where maybe you could leave for two years and come back, computers, graphic design, it moves very fast. When you leave it, you're sort of, you're probably not coming back. So into the putty world we went. I love wonder. I love experiencing it myself, and I realized in seeing my coworkers play with the product that they were feeling and seeing wonder themselves in using it. So what is wonder? Socrates, I always go back in time, and you'll see as I get a little further in law in this speech, we're gonna go back in time, but Socrates, which was a man who lived 2,500 years ago and was actually a real person, not a figment of someone's imagination, he said that wonder is the beginning of wisdom. Wonder is the beginning of wisdom. So it's to me the aha, and also the, well, hmm, that's odd, or that's interesting, or I wasn't expecting that, that leads us down a path towards discovery. And it turned out that not just myself, not just my coworkers, but adults all over the world, most of you, some of you are playing with it now, you want to experience those moments as well. Thinking putty is an odd kind of product because you put it in your hands to use it to stop thinking about it and do something else. And in that way, you can become curious. You can become engaged and interested in the world with a new perspective. It's also an odd substance. I have some here, which I will take out because you're stretching it and playing with it yourselves right now. But it also bounces, right? like a ball, you can try that at your desk and maybe you'll bounce into the person you're next to and make a new friend. It bounces, but then if we were to stretch it, and it stretches, and we tear it, it tears like paper. That's a little unusual. If you hold it up to your ear and tap on it, it makes a sound like a bouncy ball. It's a little odd. That is what helps get your mind out of the box when you're playing with thinking putty. But so when I was playing with that grayish kind of color and it was a little boring, I started thinking, could it be different? Could it be more? Could it be better? Why can't it be able to be magnetized and then it could crawl over to a magnet as if it was actually alive? Wouldn't that be cool? And just by asking the questions of why and why not leads you down all kinds of paths. I'll just do my little magnet demo here. Look at this. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. It's like a little snake charmer. Kids love it. You will too. But as creative people, we all have jobs. And in the fast-paced world of business cycles, 
we often feel pushed completely to the limit. Inspiration needs to come right now, and it's due on Friday. <laughs> and unfortunately, I was reminded at a conference uh, the other week that the pace of change in our society will never be as slow again as it is today. So we are up against a lot as creative people. It's become also a world where it's hard to be bored because we have the total sum of all human knowledge in a little glass screen at our fingertips. But because of all that focus on information and analysis and now, 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 that wonder can get lost. And if the wonder is lost, we will also lose much of the wisdom. So it's important for that wonder to allow it to come out. You need to be quiet. You need to listen because it speaks very softly. How many of you have tried meditation? How many of you have stuck with meditation for more than six months? A smaller number. Our minds are racing with thoughts and ideas. It's hard to calm the chaos. But for those of you who have stuck with it, I think you will admit many insights and clarity have come from that. Thinking putty is supposed to do that for your hands. We'll call it meditation light. You can do it while you're in class. You can do it while you're in a meeting. And when imagination is allowed to sort of bubble up, almost like the quantum foam of the universe, and it interacts with our thoughts, that is where what I call the wonder magic starts to happen. So I'm going to shoot ahead here. There's the wonder magic. I mean, who thought of that? That's a real bridge in, uh, is that in Thailand, I think, or Vietnam? So I want to tell you a story. One of the most popular products we have is Phantom Thinking Putty. And Phantom Thinking Putty, it comes with a little light, and you can draw on the putty. And that's cool. But where did that idea come from? I mean, it seems so simple now that you can go in the store and you can buy it. That's what I'd like to tell you. So I love nature, I love the outdoors, I love hiking and roaming and exploring. I've got my funny, funny shoes on here, I'm ready to go anywhere. And when I'm not traveling, I'm reading and studying about all the different amazing places in the world that we can go. Well, what I learned subconsciously was that all of these things in the world were the inspiration for what I was making, but it took years for me to realize it. So at one point I had glow in the dark putty, I had hypercolor putty, changes color with the heat from your hand, what's going to be next? Have any of you ever been to the mine in Sterling Hill, New Jersey? Anyone? Oh, this is good. This is a really unique place. And when I say unique, I mean singular on planet Earth. It is the only place in the world, which just happens to be a day trip distance for you, where you can see minerals that glow and fluoresce in the dark. It's no longer a functioning mine. It's a tourist attraction. They have a museum. They have a giant tailings pile where you can go or bring a nephew or a child and they can just smash on rocks and get to take home whatever they want. But literally hundreds of unique minerals line the walls of the mine and they glow. And I highly recommend you take a visit. It's really fantastic. During my first trip there, I was in the museum area and they had this rock and it looks just like a rock. And for those of you who are not into rocks, you say, Aaron, rocks are rocks. This is, <laughs> rocks are not exciting. But this rock was a little odd. First of all, it was from Greenland, which is sort of a far away, exotic place. I mean, not super far from us, but how many of you have been to Greenland? Exactly. One. And he's wearing a, yeah, there you go. Excellent. So this rock is only found in Greenland. And it was formed hundreds of millions of years ago, approaching a billion years ago which is a lot of years when you stop and wonder about that. And it turned out that when someone hit it with a rock hammer and cracked off a piece, and that piece was exposed to the sun, which meant they were there in the summertime because not so much in the wintertime, it turned pink. It changed color. The magical mystery mineral. And then later, when they took it home and they were looking at it in the room, the pink was gone. Then they took it outside, and the pink came back. And I have a little UV light here. And you can see, not only does it turn pink, but it has these weird orange inclusions that glow under black light. And uh, I will pass this around. This is the spot. So my tug tug tight is a little bit janky, because it's very rare and expensive. But 
um, this spot here, if you hold the light on, you'll see it'll turn purple and fade away. I'll start over here, and you guys can pass this around. Who doesn't like a little show and tell? So that got my mind thinking. You can have something you expose to light, it changes color, then it changes back. I had never heard of anything like this. And that was my aha. That was my moment of wonder. So now how do we make this into a putty? Well, okay, so let's do some research on the chemistry. Let's do a deep dive into a lot of academic papers on geology where I only understand maybe a third of the words that are being written in these papers. Let's order some on eBay and see if you just get it in your hands, maybe something will come to you. And then can this type of substance be made and mass produced? Can it be made and mass produced in a safe way? Can it be made at a cost that would work in a consumer product? Can it be integrated into the product? Is it going to degrade over time? Will it last? If you open it a year from now, will it still work? And the answer, of course, was yes, eventually yes on all these things. And so now this is a slightly different color than the tug tub tight. We do have one that's a match. But you can see I draw on it. And it has sort of a glowing trail, but then the color changes. We'll do it over here. And so our Phantom's Thinking Putty became a bestseller. How long did all that take? About three years. <laughs> and we all feel that business cycle and that need to deliver. But it's about building a wonder pipeline of constantly exposing yourself to new things. You go to the art museum, you take a vacation, you do something a little different outside of your bubble, so that you're feeding in and you're taking notes. You're always taking notes. Because things that seem completely irrelevant, as wonderful as they might be, later on in your life may have a moment where it's exactly the thing that you need. You have to be patient. So one of my personal hobbies is photography. And uh, I really enjoy the magic of chemistry and the magic of mixing chemicals, putting them on a piece of paper, and then somehow capturing an image and permanently recording it. Now, we're living in the age of sort of digital. It's a totally different universe. But imagine 100 years ago, you're mixing goo, you're putting it on paper, and pictures magically appear. It's pretty incredible all kinds of crazy concoctions. And then in addition to the concoctions, you had all of these cameras. Unlike today, where sort of a digital sensor can be fitted onto all kinds of things and do everything. You had lots of different kinds of cameras, different kinds of lenses. Well, this was the Globuscope. And I discovered the Globuscope in my deep dive into the photography world and the history of 20th century photography. And it's really interesting. I have one here. This was the first High quality, handheld, 360 degree panoramic camera. So there have been panoramic cameras. You have seen old wide panoramas on the walls at bars, but that camera weighed 80 pounds and it was fixed in place and everybody would stand like this and you would have a picture. And Ron Globus, who was the inventor, he wanted something that was a little more dynamic. You know, everyone has seen how having fast point and shoot autofocus has sort of changed what you can do versus standing there like this, smile, wait, hold, don't move, hold still for five seconds. You can do a lot more. And the way it works is you wind it up and you press the button and the film is dragged against the slit in the opposite direction at the same speed that it's rotating and it forms an image. Sort of, if you've seen 2001 when he goes into the monolith, that is the reverse of the same process, where you take a regular image and you display it through a slit and it creates those weird lines. So you invert that mathematically and that's how you get this. And I'll pass this around. You guys can feel it. Be very careful with it, please. <laughs> it's heavy and a little top heavy. So when this was introduced, uh, every f photographic aficionado had to have one. Andy Warhol had one. Everyone in the 1980s photography scene wanted one. Ron got to go to a lot of cool parties. <laughs> the design was so groundbreaking that the Museum of Modern Art actually put it on display as an exhibit, just its industrial design. Um, and really, he did all of it himself. Designed it, drew it. We can see if I go ahead here. 
did all of the patents and drawings. He was a one-man show, really smart guy. It ended up being a bit of a commercial failure because it was extremely expensive, because it was made completely by hand with a, with a, with a machinist sort of drilling out a lot of metal. Anyway, I became obsessed with this camera. And back in the days of what I'll call the end of film, 2000 to 2010, I wanted one. I just wanted it. It also, by the way, had been used as a prop to find ghosts in Ghostbusters. <laughs> so there was sort of this side audience that wasn't interested in using it as a camera. They wanted it because they loved Ghostbusters. And uh, Dan Aykroyd would sort of hold it, and it would rotate, and somehow we're finding ghosts. Anyway, it was way too pricey. The camera's thousands of dollars, even when no one is using them anymore because so few had been made and they're beautiful and I wanted one. And so I would scour eBay looking for auctions and one day I found one. The auction was for three globoscopes, which you think, well, if one is expensive, the catch was they were all completely disassembled. It was a pile of parts in a box. Maybe less attractive for the collector. And what had happened was the US Army had purchased a number of these to do surveys. They go out in the field, and they can do a 360, and they can develop the film, and they have the pictures. And then it, they broke. And probably someone at uh, Globus, the company, never called them back. And some enterprising technician said, I got this. And they took them apart. They probably took apart the first one, then couldn't figure something out. And then they took apart the second one, thinking maybe it would inform how to put the first one back together. Then they couldn't get that back together. And eventually, a box of three completely disassembled cameras. So being crazy and being fascinated with this, I decided I was going to bid on this. My theory was, I could put these back together. No problem. And then I could sell two, keep one, and maybe even make a little money on the side. So they came, and I began my deep dive. It was an entire winter. Work suffered as a result of this obsession. You can see in that drawing there on the right-hand side, that's sort of the guts. That's all I had to go with, <laughs> because there was no repair manual. There was nothing else. I would look at all the old patents. I looked at microfiche of magazines from when it was introduced in the 80s to see if some magazine had shown a shot of it open and I could glean from that the way the different parts were connected. It was all nuts and bolts and screws and springs and dials. Well, I made good progress. I actually I got them back together. And as I was completing the reassembly, I realized that there was this very unique design. It's in the handle. And in the handle, are basically weather vanes. And the weather vanes plow through this substance. And the, the friction of that is what controls the speed. So that otherwise the spring would just unwind and it would go and spin away. And you need constant speed. So this speed governance mechanism that they had built, it got, got me interested. So when I had this handle, it was completely empty. And I'm reading these patents and I realize what were these weather vanes pushing through? they were pushing through putty. 20 years before I even thought of putty, Ron Globus said, I've got a use for this stuff. I'm going to put it in the handle of this camera. And of all the people in all the world to become obsessed with this camera, <laughs> and then later discover that the one missing secret ingredient that wasn't in the box was something I had spent 10 years of my life working on and refining and experimenting with. And I had it right on the shelf, and I put it in, and it worked perfectly the first time. That's wonder. That's awe. That's all of those things. Oh, you guys like that. That's good. <laughs> but it wasn't just putting together the camera, because what happened in then researching it and then finally meeting Ron and speaking to him and going up and showing him the camera I had put back together, he was an older gentleman, you know, he was sort of, he had left business behind at that point, but I was proud to show this to him and we had a moment. But with the way he talked about silicone, the way he talked about how he had come to that solution, that moment there inspired me as to how our putty, the putty that we make at Crazy Irons, could even be better and led directly to the development 
of liquid glass, which is the crystal clear putty. You think I'm holding an empty can, but I'm not. It's in here, and it's crystal clear. So through unexpected things, magic can happen. And sometimes you realize that you have the answer to the question, but you haven't asked the question yet. You don't even know what the question's going to be. That's why you take notes. That's why you write it down, because you can't trust your memory. There's a liquid glass. That's that guy in 500 pounds of liquid glass in a bathtub. <laughs> I would recommend watching this YouTube video. It's not our video, but it's definitely worthwhile. That's the only time that will ever happen on planet Earth. So he, he did pretty good. He, he survived. So where can you find wonder? I recommend looking at old books, magazines, going to antique markets. There's fabulous antique markets out in Lancaster County. Huge warehouses just filled with everything. Sometimes even sorted and organized and sort of curated for your viewing pleasure. But what it really is, is whole generations, all of their life's hopes and dreams encapsulated in the products they made, in the writing that they did, in their poetry, in their novels, and in their catalogs of products that they used. We're the same people. We're living in this crazy complex world, but we have the same needs. And looking at the world from that perspective of 1800 or 1850 gives you that lens that takes you out of today, lets you look at today's problems in a new way, and helps you to reimagine it, reimagine it in an interesting way. So one of my favorite books on color, I work a lot in color, is uh, Werner's Nomenclature of Colors. This was published in 1814. This is a reproduction. I, I do not have a real one because they're, you know, rare. But what he did was he put together descriptions of colors. So they had a little chip, like who doesn't have a Pantone book, right? Everybody's got a Pantone book. This is pre-Pantone. And for every color, an example of animal, vegetable, or mineral. Why? Because that's all there was. There was no chemical revolution. There was no ordering pigments. You either found some rocks and ground them up, you caught a bird and you took a part of its feather, or you had a flower or a plant and maybe you pressed it and the color would stay if you were lucky, or maybe you could boil it and extract some kind of pigment or color out of it. That was the whole world of color. And in creating a nomenclature of color, the goal was so that people could talk to each other and know that they're comparing apples to apples. We take that so much for granted. When I say that something weighs a kilogram, you know what a kilogram is. But in 1812, it's a different story. If I say that the wind is blowing at 20 miles an hour, you can measure your own 20 miles an hour and know. 200, 300 years ago, it was much more loosey-goosey. So with this, it also gives you an idea of what the connection is, the human connection of those colors back to the real world and how those colors can ha be filled with emotions and the lives of animals, the lives of plants, all those things that bring life back into what has become in our world RGB values, CMYK values. Pick one from the color picker and it just magically shoots out of a machine. How do you turn color back into something that is exciting? It is the most engaging of all the senses. We are visual animals. We have color vision. Many animals do not. How do you make sure that what you're doing creatively really, really hits the mark? So for us in developing thinking putties, when we make teal thinking putty, we have the Australian teal, the duck, in mind. How do we evoke the, that color? Not just sort of a general vague sense of teal. That's the original teal. Or turquoise as a mineral. Or foxfire, the uh, putty I showed you that glows and changes. Right? There are mushrooms in the forest that glow at night and they called it foxfire because they had no idea what it was. How can we evoke that vision, that mystery, that imagination, that sense of wonder of walking into the forest and having the path lit for you by forces unknown? And uh, we also have chameleon, and I think he, chameleon, right? That's, it's a little more direct. 
It's a little more direct. So in this world of CMYK and RGB, you think all the colors are just there. But you realize there's a gamut for your computer screen. There's a gamut for what you can print. There are colors that when you go to a tropical fish aquarium and you see these, you can't capture those on a page. But they exist, and they can inform what you do. And you can strive to push the boundaries and the limits so that people can have those experiences. Purples that are the purplest purple you have ever seen. And then there's forbidden colors. I don't know if you or any of you are aware of forbidden colors. But these are colors that sort of mathematically exist, but we can't see them. So think about a greenish red or a bluish yellow. Because they're actually opposite each other, you, you can't do it. But if you go, when you go leave here and you go stare at your laptop screen really close, and you put one eye on the blue and one eye on the yellow, and if you do that for five minutes without blinking, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, according to some studies, you will peer beyond the veil. And you will have a glimpse for a moment of an impossible color that exists in the real world that your brain can't even figure out how to process. So between the realm of the possible and the impossible, that is where the maybe comes in, the barely possible, the wonder, the thing we're trying to develop and create. It's sort of like negative numbers. Negative numbers exist. I don't think anyone's going to say that they don't. But you can't have negative one of something in a box. The box is either empty or it has objects. It doesn't have negative objects. But your inventory on your computer screen says you have negative. It's very strange, very nebulous. So the idea is to put yourself in a position to fail, to be searching, to be searching for nothing, to think about nothing, see what bubbles up from that void. Look for the forgotten mysteries. There are unexplored places on Earth that can lead to your inspiration. You have to dig around for them, and sometimes the best way to find them is wandering because they're not on any map. With all that hard work, you can find your magic. If you stay open to being creative, to having possibilities, to being patient and realizing that you may solve a problem now, that you won't be able to use for five years, but it's worth writing down. If you go out there and get inspired by the unknown in that way, you do not know where it will lead you, but I guarantee you it will lead to great places. So all I ask of you is to get out there and look, and good luck. Thank you very much.